Amen. Thank you, Ben. If you will, turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. And while you're turning there, let me say a word of appreciation to Dr. Greenway and the administration for uh, this kind invitation for me to be here and preach this morning in chapel. What a joy and privilege it is to be here and be a part of this community and to stand here and proclaim God's word to you this morning. And thank you, Dr. Dockery, for that kind introduction and for the wonderful job you're doing leading us academically uh, in this role. Now, if you were with us this past Thursday in chapel, you not only heard a great sermon from Zane Pratt, uh, you also witnessed what is uh, all, in all probability, the closest living resemblance to the B.H. Carroll beard that you will ever see in modern Baptist life. It was quite impressive. Now, let me say here at the outset that I realize preaching from the book of Revelation can be a dangerous venture, especially in a Baptist seminary and in a Baptist college, because there are likely different interpretive viewpoints and millennial perspectives that exist in this room. But this particular passage that we're going to look at, Revelation 11, verses 15 through 19, shouldn't serve as some sort of battleground for us, but rather my hope, my prayer, is that it serves as common ground. Because regardless of what uh, interpretive perspective you may have on the book of Revelation, most people see this passage in the same way, that it is pointing us to the blowing of the seventh trumpet and therefore the return of our Lord Jesus Christ and his bringing the eternal kingdom of God. So in chapters 8 and 9, you have the blowing of the first six trumpets, all of which are partial judgments brought on to the world and all set the stage for the full and final judgment that will come with the blowing of this seventh trumpet. So chapters 8 and 9, you have the blowing of the first six trumpets, then an interlude, a pause, if you will. Just like there's a pause, an interlude between the first six seals being opened, and then we wait for the seventh. So you have the first six trumpets blown, then you have this interlude in chapter 10 and the first part of chapter 11, and then we come to the blowing of the seventh trumpet, which sounds forth a call for Christ to come and for the kingdom to come in full. And this passage gives us a preview of what we're told later in more detail of what the kingdom to come will be like. But this passage still gives us a clear and beautiful picture of the hope that is ours. So let's look together at Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. I'm going to ask if you're able, would you please stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Hear the word of the Lord. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints. And those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. 
Most of you are likely familiar with the Andrew Peterson song, Is He Worthy? Which is a beautiful call and response. Questions being asked and then answered. And I want to put those questions and their answers before you for just a moment this morning. And I want you to think on them. I want you to reflect on them. I want them to sit with you for a bit. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. And is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. It really is. Brothers and sisters, we need to remind ourselves of these truths because daily, daily, we are reminded of the brokenness and the darkness in this world. Disease, disasters, death, war, violence, pain, suffering, abuse, scandal. That's what fills the headlines. That is what constantly grabs our attention. That is the voice that seems to shout the loudest in our ears, drowning out everything else. That is what tends to dominate our thinking and our conversations. And because of that, it's all too easy for us to grow discouraged, to grow fearful, to lose heart, and to lose hope. Which is why it's good to remind ourselves that this broken world will not always be broken. It will one day be healed and made whole. It's why it's good to remind ourselves that wickedness will not win, that sin and evil will not triumph, that darkness will one day yield to the light, that suffering and sorrow, trials and tribulation, pain and pandemics, they will all be things of the past. One day, they will all be no more. It is good to remind ourselves that yes, creation is groaning as in the pains of childbirth, but the new creation is kicking in the womb and its day will come. It is good that we remind ourselves that the kingdom of God in all its fullness, in all its glory, and all its power is coming. And that's exactly what our text this morning from Revelation 11 does for us. It reminds us of these glorious truths. It is a beautiful picture of the coming kingdom of God. It is a reminder that we will one day see it all made new. We will one day have the glory of the Lord be shining right in our very midst. It's a reminder that our God really does intend to dwell again with us, his people. It's a reminder that God will answer our prayers for his kingdom to come. That the seventh trumpet will sound and the Lord Jesus Christ will come again. So brothers and sisters, I want us to hear this reminder from this text this morning. I want it to fill us with hope and with comfort and encouragement to help us to keep persevering, to keep bearing witness, to keep being faithful in the midst of this broken and dark world, knowing what our hope is and what we have to look forward to. So as we look at this passage together, I want to point out three certainties of the coming kingdom. Three certainties of the coming kingdom. And I say certainties because even though the kingdom hasn't come in full yet, 
it's spoken of here in this text in the past tense, as if it's already come, as if it's a matter of fact, as if it's already happened, reminding us that these truths are sure and certain to come to pass. So three certainties of the coming kingdom. Certainty number one, God's reign will be unrivaled. God's reign will be unrivaled. When the seventh and final trumpet sounds and Jesus Christ comes again, God will reign unchallenged, unopposed, unrivaled. That's what we see. That's the certainty that we're told of here in the first few verses of this text. Look again at verses 15 through 17. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. Now with the blowing of this seventh trumpet, the time for warning is over. And the time for the kingdom has come. Because when the seventh trumpet sounds, then the Lord Jesus Christ will return. And as we're told later in Revelation, on that day, the skies will split open and Jesus Christ will come riding on a great white horse with all the angel armies of heaven behind him. And he will come in all his glory, in all his splendor as the King of kings and Lord of lords, the King of glory, mighty in battle. And when he comes, then these loud voices in heaven announce what will happen on that day. On that day, the kingdom of the world will be handed over to the true king. It will yield to, it will bow down before, it will recognize that there is only one real king. There is only one true sovereign and he shall reign supreme. He shall reign without rival, without opposition, without challenge. Challenge. The kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign unrivaled forever and ever. Now, most of you will likely recognize verse 15 from Handel's Messiah and the Hallelujah Chorus. And as you know, it's customary to stand when the Hallelujah Chorus is sung. And the story behind that custom is that when England's King George II first heard the Hallelujah Chorus, he sprang to his feet because he recognized that the king they were singing of, the exalted Lord Jesus Christ, was a superior king than he was. It was a superior sovereign than he was. And so he rose to honor him as the one true king. Now, whether that is actually what happened or not, I don't know. Some say King George had just fallen asleep during Handel's Messiah, and when the Hallelujah Chorus started, it startled him, and he was surprised, and he just stood up because he didn't know what else to do. I'll let the faculty in the School of Church Music uh, handle that one because they can speak to it much better than I can. But I mentioned that initial story, the story behind the custom. Because in a sense, that is what will happen when this seventh trumpet sounds and the Lord Jesus Christ comes again in glory to commence his eternal reign. No one will stay in their seat on that day. No one will fail to recognize him and honor him as king. No one will wonder who the true sovereign is because on that day, everyone will recognize without a shadow of a doubt that the one true king, the one true sovereign is a risen Galilean with holes in his hands and his feet and he will reign forever and ever. And we will all celebrate his unrivaled reign. Now, I realize we're at a seminary, a Christian college, so 
We know that the kingdom of God has already come in part, right? And we know that Christ already reigns now. We know that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. But we also know that the Bible clearly calls Satan the ruler of this world. And so we know that the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of sin, constantly contest Christ's rule. It is constantly trying to set up a rival kingdom to the kingdom of God. And so what we are assured of here is that on this day, when this trumpet sounds and Christ comes again, then there will be no more challenge to his reign. There will be no more rivals. There will be no more contesting his rule because Jesus will have fully and finally put away all opposition to his rule. Every enemy will be placed under his feet. And the kingdom of this world, which to us at times seems so impressive, so powerful, so invincible, it will melt before the majesty of the true king. It will yield to true sovereignty, true power, true authority. And it will recognize that Jesus Christ alone is the king. And in verse 16, the 24 elders who are there before the throne of God, at this reality, they fall on their faces and they worship God. And listen to what they say there in verse 17. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was. Now stop right there. If you're familiar with the language of Revelation, you know that when we hear this description of God used in this book, what we are used to hearing is God described as the one who is and who was and who is to come. But the who is to come is missing here. Why? Because he's already come. Because the king has come. And they recognize that he has come. And they recognize why he has come. There in the rest of verse 17. For you have taken your great power and begun to reign. You have begun to reign. So the coming kingdom involves the joint rule of our Lord and of his Christ, of God the Father and God the Son, of the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man, of him who sits on the throne and the Lamb, reigning together, exercising joint sovereignty. They, they aren't ruling in competition with one another, but in concert with one another. Brothers and sisters, th this is the fulfillment of Daniel 7. This is the fulfillment of Psalm 2. This is the fulfillment of Zechariah 14. This is what Satan tried to tempt Jesus with in Matthew 4, that he would give him all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus resisted being king without the cross. But now you see the great reversal as all the kingdoms of the world are given to King Jesus and Satan himself must bow before him as the true king of this world. Brothers and sisters, that is the certainty that we are promised about God's coming kingdom. God will reign unrivaled. He will definitively and decisively put an end to all opposition. He will fully defeat all his enemies and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Certainty number two about the coming kingdom. God's enemies will be judged. God's enemies will be judged. Now friends, if we're honest, sometimes, maybe even oftentimes, it feels as if human history is a story where the bad guys always win. It feels as if this world in which we live is, is a movie where the villain keeps coming out on top. 
And so often sin and evil seem to triumph. Injustice seems to win out and it feels like they always will. But here we are reminded that that is simply not the case. That is not the way the story of the world ends because when the kingdom comes, then the day of judgment comes as well. Look at verse 18. The nations raged, there's Psalm 2, but your wrath came. The nations raged, but your wrath, O oh God, came. The, the nations raged against God and his rule. They, they rebelled. The wicked resisted his reign. They rejected him as king. They defied him in their anger. But on that day, they will have to face God's anger. They will experience the fury of the wrath of the Almighty. They will have to stand before the king who they have rejected and defied, and they will have to face the consequences. The angry nations will get a taste of God's anger. That's why we have this terrifying reminder at the end of the passage, there at the very end of verse 19, where John says there were, there were flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and earthquake and heavy hail. This is a symbolic reminder that God is not to be taken lightly. You defy him and you reject him at your own risk. Because this is a warning of the power and the fury of his wrath. When I was a child, staying at my grandparents, if I would misbehave, my grandfather would often warn me by saying, boy, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to cloud up and storm all over you. Now, he was joking. God is not. God is not joking. This is a warning that the storm of his wrath will fall on all his enemies. And then we see this certainty that all of his enemies will be judged, communicated there at the end of verse 18, where it says the time has come for destroying the destroyers of the earth. This is John's way of describing the, the wicked who persecute the people of God. And the time will come when they will be destroyed. In other words, the punishment will fit the crime. They will get a taste of their own medicine because they who have destroyed will themselves be destroyed. They will learn what it's like to be on the receiving end of destruction for a change. That's what we're assured of here. That when the kingdom comes, the day of judgment comes as well and all God's enemies will be judged. That's why we read what we read there in the middle of verse 18. The nations raged, your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged. All the world will stand before God to face judgment. On this day, God will have begun his unrivaled reign and justice will be dispensed by the rightful judge and the rightful king of the world. And that means on this day, every wrong will be made right. Every injustice will be dealt with on this day. This is why we don't have to be vigilantes. This is why we don't have to try to take justice into our own hands or seek revenge because we trust that God will bring judgment. Brothers and sisters, justice delayed does not mean justice denied. God will avenge his people. God will bring judgment. There is a judge and when his kingdom comes, be assured he will bring judgment on his enemies. Now, while this truth should bring us a sense of comfort and encouragement in the face of opposition, in the face of injustice, in the face of persecution, it also 
ought to serve as at least something of an impetus for us to be spurred on in our efforts of evangelism and missions. And here's why. Because even though we know and take comfort in the fact that one day God will judge his enemies and therefore our enemies, we also need to remember that Our God is slow to anger and abounding in love. And right now, in his patience, in his grace, while we await this day which has not come, God is patiently taking delight in saving even his enemies. He is right now taking pleasure in pardoning his foes. And how do we know that that is the case? The reason we know that that is the case is because we were all once his enemies. We weren't pretty good people who just needed a little push in the right direction. No, we were enemies of God. We were hostile to him. But in love and in grace, he saved us and he changed us and he made us his own. And because of what Christ has done on our behalf, because he has suffered judgment in our place and bore the wrath that we deserve, we who were once children of wrath are now children of God. And so let us take that good news that God delights in saving even his enemies to those who are still the enemies of God. And let us invite them to lay down their arms and surrender to King Jesus and know that they will find welcome and pardon and love. Because make no mistake, those who remain his enemies will be judged. And that leads us to certainty number three. The third certainty about the coming kingdom we see in this text is that God's servants will be rewarded. God's servants will be rewarded. This is the other side of the coin. On one side is God's judgment of his enemies, but on the other side is God's rewarding of his servants. The eternal blessing he bestows on his redeemed people. So look again at verse 18. You see the first Half of the coin in the first half of the verse. The nations rage, your wrath came, the time for the dead to be judged. And then the other side. And for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints and those who fear your name, both small and great. God's people, his servants, the prophets and the saints, all those who fear his name, whether small or great, we all will receive not the judgment we deserve, but reward. We will receive reward, and our reward, at least the most significant aspect of our reward, is that we are delivered from judgment. We are rescued from the storm of his wrath, and we are instead made a kingdom of priests to reign with him and to enjoy the blessings of his eternal kingdom. If you are a Christian, then I assure you, your best life is not now. It is yet to come. Because the day is coming when you will receive the reward of your inheritance. You will receive the reward of your faith and your service. You will receive the reward that has been won for you by Jesus Christ, but which he promises to give to you on that day. You will reign with him in a kingdom that will not end, in a kingdom where there will be no more night and there will be no more darkness and the glory of the Lord will be the light that shines in our midst in a kingdom where there will be no more disease and no more death and no more disasters and no more pain and no more pandemics and no more suffering and no more mourning and no more tears because he will wipe every tear from our eyes and there will be no more enemies and there will be no more evil and there will be no more curse and all the ransom church of God will be saved to sin no more. We will sin no more because we will be delivered from our every enemy because every enemy will have been put under Christ's feet. And if that weren't enough, look at what we read in verse 19. Then God's temple in heaven was opened and the ark of his covenant 
was seen within his temple. God's temple in heaven is open and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. Think of what this is meant to communicate to us. This symbolic picture of God's presence with his people, the Ark of the Covenant, the temple. The temple is now open and the Ark of the Covenant is seen. The Ark of the Covenant was the very symbol of God's presence dwelling with his people. And it was kept in the Holy of Holies unseen. No one got to see it except the high priest, and he only got to see it one day out of the year on the Day of Atonement. And even then, it was covered with smoke. But here, here, we, we're told that the temple is open and the ark is seen. Because we know that when Christ died, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom with this curtain that separated the holy of holies from the, the people of God. It's torn in two, which means that the problem that separated us from God, the problem of sin, has been done away with. Christ has made fellowship with God possible so that now we are told God's temple stands open in heaven and the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies is seen. All of which is meant to help us realize that in the coming kingdom, we will enjoy unhindered access to our God. Nothing will hinder or get in the way of our fellowship with God because the problem of sin will be a problem no more. We will enjoy unhindered fellowship with God. He will again dwell with us, his people. We shall see his face. That is our reward. We shall see God. We will gaze on the glory and on the beauty of the Lord. The dwelling place of God will again be with man. He will dwell with us and we will be his people and he will be our God. That's the heart of the covenant promises. And that is what we are promised here. Friends, that's the kingdom that is coming. A kingdom where God will reign unrivaled and his enemies will be judged and his servants will be rewarded. Now, I want you to think about those three certainties these certainties that we see here in light of what we know we are told later in the book of Revelation. What we're told in Revelation 19 through 22. Isn't this exactly how we see the end unfolding there? I mean, think about it. Revelation 19, Christ comes again and in glory as the King of kings and Lord of lords to wage war against the kingdom of the world. And he is victorious, beginning his unrivaled reign. And then in chapter 20, what do we see happening? We see God judging his enemies. We see the great white throne of judgment and all the dead being judged. And then in chapters 21 and 22, we see the servants of God enjoying their reward, the new heavens and the new earth, the new creation, the eternal kingdom of God and all its blessings. There in those chapters, we see it all in detailed description. Here we just see it as a preview, a hope of what is to come. But there's something else I want you to realize. There's something else I want you to think about. Not only should we see this text pointing us forward, to Revelation 19 through 22, I think we also ought to see this text pointing us backwards, back to the Old Testament. Because where else in the scriptures do we read about the blowing of seven trumpets and the Ark of the Covenant and the defeat of God's enemies and the reward for his people? Isn't this the pattern we see with Joshua and the Israelites when they finally end their wilderness wanderings and they're able to enter their reward, the promised land? We I mean, think about it. Israel is promised that God will reward them with rest in the land of promise, the land of Canaan, that they will finally rest from their wandering in the wilderness. 
And so what happens when they finally reach the border of the promised land, when they come to that first occupied city of Jericho? God promises that he will defeat their enemies. He will drive them out. So he tells Joshua to gather all the people and to have the priest carry what? The Ark of the Covenant. And to have seven priests ready with what? Seven trumpets. And they are to march around the city, blowing the trumpets and carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And they do this for six days, warning the Canaanites of the judgment that is about to come, that is about to fall. And then finally on the seventh day, when the seven trumpets are blown. The walls of the city come falling down and God defeats his enemies and he brings his people into their reward, into the land of promise. Brothers and sisters, I think we are meant to see that pattern playing out here in Revelation 11. God has been sounding the first six trumpets as warnings to the world as his church marches all across the world to the ends of the earth under the banner of the gospel. And the day is coming when those warning trumpets will sound no longer and the seventh trumpet will finally sound and Christ our King will come and he will defeat our enemies. He will drive out all opposition and he will reign unrivaled. And our long and painful wandering through the wilderness of this world will be over and the cry of victory will go up and the walls of this old world will come crashing down and we will enter into the promised land of the new creation, of the new Canaan, of the new Eden, of the new Jerusalem, of the new heavens and the new earth and he will dwell with us there and we will enter into our reward, into our rest and the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever Ever, and we will reign there with him. Hallelujah. So let me ask you again. Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? But do you know the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made new, you will. You will. Is all creation groaning? Is a new creation coming? And is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Oh, it is. It is. So let's do just that this morning. Let's sing those words. Let's remind ourselves of these truths and may they fill us with hope for the day to come. Let's pray together. Well, God, we thank you for these certainties of your coming kingdom that you have given to us in your word. May they fill us with joy and confidence and hope this morning. And Lord, may you use them to help us even now to persevere in this broken world while we wait for the coming of our King and his kingdom, the Lamb who is worthy, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Would you stand as we sing together?